I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this podcast of The People's Pharmacy. You can find previous podcasts and more information on a range of health topics at peoplespharmacy.com. It's a truism that America is a youth-oriented society. Why are negative stereotypes about aging so destructive? This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. Some doctors see older people through a lens of disability and decrepitude. Does that have an impact on their prescribing patterns and their patients' health? When people apply a stereotype to you, it can be aggravating. Has someone assumed you might not understand a complex health problem because of your age or appearance? Why do certain other countries value older people rather than treat them as liabilities? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, how your beliefs about aging determine how long and well you live. In The People's Pharmacy Health Headlines... The Department of Health and Human Services declared monkeypox a public health emergency in the United States. This week, total cases reported since the spring reached more than 9,000. But that's almost certainly an undercount because it's difficult to get tested for this virus. In addition, contact tracing similar to that done in the early stages of the COVID pandemic could help public health officials vaccinate known contacts of cases quickly and stop the spread. However, chronically underfunded public health departments are struggling to do this. Experts are concerned that the start of a new academic year could allow for widespread transmission of the virus on college and university campuses. It's spread by skin-to-skin or face-to-face contact. Unless campus health programs are prepared to detect, treat, and prevent monkeypox, it could become an even more serious problem over the next few months. University health officials need tests, vaccines, and antivirals to help control it. In 1979, the U.S. eradicated polio. This viral disease has been all but eliminated from most of the world. Pakistan and Afghanistan are the remaining exceptions. Now, however, a case of paralyzing polio has been diagnosed in New York. The young adult affected had never been vaccinated. More worrisome is the discovery of polio virus in wastewater samples in neighboring New York counties. This suggests that the virus may be spreading in several communities. The state health commissioner of New York warned that hundreds of people could already be infected. A surprising number of children and adults have not been vaccinated against polio, even though the shots are 99 percent effective in kids. The health commissioner is encouraging everyone who has not been vaccinated against polio to get their shots immediately. Polio is a devastating disease that can lead to disability and death. Veterinarians can vaccinate dogs against Lyme disease, but there's no FDA-approved Lyme immunization for humans at this time. However, a collaborative effort by pharmaceutical giant Pfizer with the French drug maker Valneva may change that. The companies are conducting a 6,000-person Phase three study of a Lyme disease vaccine in parts of the U.S. and Europe where the disease is common. The University of Massachusetts Medical School, located in Massachusetts where Lyme disease is endemic, is working on a monoclonal antibody. Phase 1 trials are currently underway. For now, the best protection is a painstaking tick check whenever you come in from the garden or the woods. Perhaps by 2025, though, the study will have been completed and submitted to the FDA. If it's successful, there's a chance of access to the Lyme disease vaccine for anyone over five years old. The prevailing theory behind Alzheimer's disease has been the buildup of plaques made of excess amounts of beta amyloid. Many drugs effectively reduce beta amyloid buildup, but none have really reversed the development of dementia. A new study suggests that two common viral infections may be partially responsible for brain deterioration. 
Researchers have pinpointed the varicella zoster virus that causes chickenpox and shingles as a culprit. The other virus, herpes simplex, is responsible for cold sores. Both viruses can hibernate in the brain. Upon reactivation, they can cause neuroinflammation, which may damage critical brain structures. Preventing shingles attacks with vaccination and cold sores with antiviral medication may be helpful. Can people do anything to reduce their risks of developing cognitive decline as they age? A new study in the journal Neurology suggests the answer is yes. Researchers studied more than 1,000 people born in Britain in 1946. They factored in the results of intelligence tests at age 8, educational attainment by age 26, leisure activity participation at age 43, occupation up to 53, reading ability tested at age 53, and APOE genotype, and cognitive ability at age 69. A study author summarized the results. Taking part in an intellectually, socially, and physically active lifestyle may help ward off cognitive decline and dementia. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. For decades, advertisers have prized their target demographic of people between 18 and 34. That's because it's been an article of faith that these young adults are the movers and shakers with money to spend. This spills over into other aspects of daily life as well. Young people are influential. Older people are considered irrelevant. Unless the advertisers are promoting prescription drugs for arthritis, diabetes, and ulcerative colitis. Ageism pervades American life. What impact does it have on our health and well-being? To find out, we turn to Dr. Becca Levy. She is a professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health and professor of psychology at Yale University. Her research explores factors that influence older individuals' cognitive and physical functioning, as well as their longevity. For example, how do positive and negative age stereotypes create beneficial and adverse effects on the health of older individuals? Dr. Levy's book is Breaking the Age Code, How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Becca Levy. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Dr. Levy, we've all heard about and in some cases had had to deal with isms, racism, sexism, anti-Semitism. Your new book deals with something that people may not be as familiar with, and that is ageism and uh, its negative consequences. I, I wonder if you can tell us what is structural ageism? That's a good question. So ageism was first coined by Dr. Robert Butler when he noticed age discrimination in a housing complex in Washington, D.C. And he noticed that this whole neighborhood were uh, protesting seniors moving into this uh, housing complex. And he thought at the time that it seemed parallel to other forms of discrimination based on race or gender or different forms of identity. So he actually coined the term. And even though that was about 50 years ago, unfortunately, it's still very prevalent in our society. So World Health Organization recently said that they thought ageism was perhaps the one of the most prevalent and also one of the most socially accepted forms of discrimination prejudice in our society. And the structural piece is referring to how ageism can be baked into the power structures of, of our culture. So there are examples of how ageism can operate in healthcare, for example, in advertising, in a lot of places that hold power have been found to not give equal opportunities to people based on their age, not including older people in, in the best types of treatment, the best types of um, jobs, job opportunities. So, um, so that that is getting at the idea of, of the structural level of ageism. 
Dr. Levy, I'm wondering, what are the effects of ageism on a person who is, at this point, uh, no longer a young person? What are the effects on their mental and physical health? Well, yes. Yeah, so that's that's a good question and something that is I've been trying to examine in in my research. And so, um, and actually, first notice the impact of these um, age beliefs on on health when I had the opportunity to go to Japan as a graduate student, and I went there to try to understand why it is that. Japan actually at the time had the longest lifespan in the world. And the first thing that I noticed when I arrived in Tokyo was how older people were treated very differently than uh, what I was used to observing in the United States with many examples of ageism. In, when I arrived in Japan, what I noticed was older people were integrated into society in many ways. They were celebrated. They have a national holiday, which honors older people. There's many examples of older people being treated like rock stars in comic books and on, on television, on celebrity shows. And so I became really interested in this idea of how these age beliefs that exist in a culture can actually impact health span and lifespan. And um, after after having that hypothesis from, from this uh, visit, I've been able to pull that apart and look at that with different types of studies. And we've found that these age beliefs that people taken from their culture can impact, as you said, uh, cognitive health physical health and mental health. So people who take in more uh, negative age beliefs, it can lead to harmful effects on those outcomes. And then the flip side is people who are able to take in more positive age beliefs or strengthen positive age beliefs, we have found can show benefits in those same health outcomes. Dr. Levy, I found the story that you shared about your grandma Horty before you went to Japan quite fascinating. Could you describe it for our listeners, please? Sure. Yes. So the story that you're referring to is something that inspired me to want to try to understand how it is that these age beliefs can impact our health. So uh, when I was in graduate school, right, actually right before I, I went to Japan, I visited my grandmother, who at the time was living in Florida. And when I arrived, she immediately thought that it would be great to take me to a market to buy citrus fruits, buy grapefruits and oranges. She thought I could use some vitamin C after being in cold Boston weather. And so we went to a market and she was a very fast walker. She had grown up in New York and, and, and loved walking everywhere. And uh, she, at the time, she was 74 and we were walking together in the market and she walked a little bit ahead of me. And unfortunately, there was a crate that somebody had left in the middle of the aisle and she tripped over it and it had very sharp edges and it left a gash in her leg, which was really awful. And she was on the floor and yeah, it was this terrible moment. And I, I helped her up and we were leaving the market together and we saw the manager at the door and we said to him, you know, what had happened because we didn't want it to happen to anybody else. And we were hoping that he would take this crate away, away out of the aisle. Uh, so, so we explained how she'd fallen over it. And his immediate reaction, instead of apologizing, he looked at her and she said, well, she shouldn't be walking around anyway. Look at her. She's an older person. She shouldn't be out here. And it was just, uh, so not only was he rude, but he was very um, dismissive of her as being an older person. And what I noticed was that his ageist comments to her, even after her, her leg had healed. So fortunately, it was a pretty superficial wound and, she, and the wound itself got better. But what I noticed was the words of the manager really had this impact on her. And I noticed that she felt sort of diminished as, as a older person, and she didn't want to engage in a number of her behaviors that she usually engaged in. So she didn't want to go on her usual walks. She didn't want to go out to um, water the plants that she usually had took great pride in taking care of. And so I I, I just I noticed that these negative messages could have a really negative impact on her. And it made me wonder you know, if as a society, if we have all this negative messaging about aging and advertising and, in, you know, in different forms of media, is it possible that that negative messaging can be can have an impact on a large scale on our health? And so that's something that prompted me to, to really go into this research. Dr. Levy, I'm wondering why most people don't know about ageism until it comes up and bites them. Why don't younger people realize that 
there are all these ageist messages out there? Well, I think part of it is because we've gone from being one of the most age integrated societies to one of the most age segregated societies. And so I think for a lot of younger people, they just don't have opportunities to interact with older people on a, on a day-to-day basis. I think another reason that ageism isn't something that we're aware of is that we know that it can operate unconsciously or, or without, without our awareness, it can have an impact on us. And the third reason I think that often we don't, um, many people don't realize until they pick up the skills to notice it, that ageism is operating is because it's so, um, so baked into our society that it's sometimes hard to notice unless we develop the skills to become aware of some of the messaging. Dr. Levy, tell us about your 7.5 longevity study, Uh, what you found and why it was important and and why you compare it to a virus and how a virus might be treated. Right. So the 7.5 refers to a study that I conducted in the town of Oxford, Ohio. So after getting back from Japan and having this hypothesis that these age beliefs that exist in a culture can impact health and health span and lifespan, I didn't know how to how to actually study it. And then I came across this uh, wonderful study that had been started decades ago by this sociologist named Robert Ashley. And he interviewed everybody in the town who was 50 and older who wanted to be part of the study about their age beliefs, but he didn't have any health measures. And so when I found this town in which everybody had given their age beliefs at an, at an early age, they were all 50 and older um, when, when he interviewed them. So when I found this data set, I was able to work with a sociologist there named Suzanne Kunkel, and we matched those belief uh, measures to longevity information. And what we found was that those who had taken in more positive age beliefs, who expressed it at the beginning of the study, they had a median survival of uh, advantage over those who had taken in more negative age beliefs. And the advantage was seven and a half years. So I think that's what you're referring to. And and what you said about um, how, how I've thought about it in relation to a virus is I think um, so. So I think I wrote about when when we first have noticed that finding was that often when there's a physio- physiological cause of a longevity difference, I think it's we often take note of it and think about policies to to change to to take that into account. But I think sometimes when there's a structural cause like ageism, it's not as quick for us to think about solutions and and think about ways to address it. You're listening to Dr. Becca Levy. She's professor of epidemiology in the Yale School of Public Health and is affiliated with the Yale Institute for Global Health. Dr. Levy studies how age stereotypes from the culture affect health. Her new book is Breaking the Age Code, How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live. After the break, if beliefs have such a big impact on aging, how can we help people change their attitudes? Dr. Levy found that people walk faster and their balance is better if they have positive views on what it means to get older and wiser. Why do Americans mostly have negative stereotypes about older people? I really appreciate that she's looked at the impact of culture. There are places where older individuals are treasured. Can we change the way doctors relate to older people? You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Cocovia, maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements. Cocoflavanols are among the most well-studied plant-based nutrients, backed by 20 years of scientific research. Cocovia Cardio Health is available in capsules or powder, providing 500 milligrams of cocoflavanols daily. This supports better blood flow and vascular performance. Cocovia also offers Memory Plus, a supplement with 750 milligrams of cocoflavanols. This product is backed by four different clinical studies, demonstrating significant improvement in several aspects of memory. Cocovia flavanols offer you all the benefits of chocolate without the sugar. Get 15% off your order by using the discount code PEOPLES15. That discount code, PEOPLES15. 
More information at cocovia.com. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, the maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs, providing transparency through its Meet Your Herbs platform, tracing the origin and DNA of each product. More information at Gaia, that's G-A-I-A Herbs, dot com. Today we're learning how ageism affects our health. The ads we see on TV suggest that if we all just take prescription drugs, we can be active and happy no matter what our age. Our guest is Dr. Becca Levy, professor of epidemiology in the Yale School of Public Health and professor of psychology in the Department of Psychology at Yale University. Her book is Breaking the Age Code, How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live. Dr. Levy, if people's beliefs about aging and how it's going to affect them, have such a profound impact on how it actually does affect them. How can we change that? What sorts of adjustments can we make to people's attitudes? Well, I think the ideal would be to bring about structural change. So we talked about structural ageism. So I think the ideal would be to create a more age-just society. And so I think there are definitely things that we can do on a societal level. And so in the book, I talk about um, the ideal of creating an age liberation movement that brings about a more age-just society. And replicate some of the age positive examples of other cultures that that we know now exist in which older people are celebrated. But because I think it's going to take a little while for us to get rid of ageism in our in our culture, uh, I think meanwhile, it's really important to think about tools that we can learn to navigate and to find ways to reduce the negative age beliefs and strengthen the positive age beliefs. And so in the book, I present about 14 evidence-based tools that are directed at that. And if you want, I can give you an example or two. I would love that, please. Okay, sure. So I think one of the most powerful ones that we've noticed is something that I call age belief journaling. And what this does is it increases our awareness of some of the messages that we encounter in everyday life. And so what this involves is over a week, writing down every time you encounter any kind of portrayal of aging. So it could be streaming your favorite show on Netflix. It could be overhearing a conversation in a coffee shop. It could be uh, reading, reading a magazine and noticing different types of advertisements. So anytime you see a portrayal of aging, Um, I suggest that you write it down and then take a moment to think about whether the portrayal is positive or negative. And if it's negative, take a moment and think about whether it's possible that there could have been a different portrayal of the older person that perhaps showed some strength of, of the older person. So for example, if you watch a television show and the only older character on it is a is a principal who's mean and grumpy, you know, and, and uh, argumentative with the, with the kids in the school. Think about whether it's possible that there could have been included a different portrayal of an older person. So could there have been a principal who, in fact, gave wisdom and and advice to the kids in the school? So two things to do are to mark whether it's positive, mark whether it's negative. If it's negative, think about whether there could be a positive portrayal instead. And then the third thing, which is important, is to think about whether older people are actually portrayed at all. So in many um, forms of media, older people are just left out, are excluded. And so if you notice, if you watch a show, for example, and you notice that everybody's under the age of 20 and there's no, no older characters in it, then mark that down as well. Because we also know that the absence of a group can lead to marginalization of that group and a, and a feeling of exclusion of that group. So what I found is if you undertake those different tasks over a week, it can really increase awareness of the messaging and help us think about how to shift some of the negative messaging. 
Dr. Levy, speaking of media and advertising, you have written in your book, quote, one reason Western medicine so heavily relies on negative age stereotypes with their narrative of inevitable decline is that it's profitable. And I guess I'm going to flip that because if you watch any television at all these days, you see a lot of prescription drug advertising. And a lot of that prescription drug advertising is, in fact, pointed right towards older people because there, there are ads for arthritis drugs, or, uh, ads for diabetes drugs, drugs for cancer, drugs for heart failure, and they often have a lot of older people in them. But here's where it gets a little bit catchy, a little confusing. These are older people who are really active. They're having fun. They're playing with their grandkids. They're out on the sailboat. They're diving into the water. I mean, they are just having the time of their life. All thanks to the drug. It's like medicines. They'll make you feel younger, better, happier, wiser. You're just going to have a great time if you... Ask your doctor for a prescription for drug X. So the pharmaceutical industry has figured this out, and they're portraying older people as being great as long as they're taking their medicine. Yes, <laughs> and that certainly is a portrayal. And, and, and I, I agree with you that that certainly is a you know, popular narrative in, in certain types of ads. So I think there's nothing wrong with you know, featuring um, the advantages of, of certain health products, because we certainly know that, that um, pills and medications can do wonder, it can give us a lot of benefits. But I think you're right that there is this possible narrative that is is could be harmful of thinking that um, that's the only source of, uh, of of good health and so I think one of the things that uh, I think is really important is that in advertising we think about a diverse portrayal of older people and many different ethnicities races genders uh, health, health levels uh, you know many people of all, all different sources benefiting from each other in many different ways. So so I think you're right that if that's the only form of advertising that we see that that could could, could be harmful. So it would be great if there was a an inclusion of of a many different uh, ways of thinking about aging and and sources of aging health. Dr. Levy, I understand that you have done some interesting experiments in your lab at Yale. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about um, changes that you've been able to measure in memory and gait and balance and uh, walking speed by changing people's age stereotypes. And, And that's especially relevant in light of some new research just published recently about walking speed and longevity. Right. Yes. So in my research team, we've looked at these, this idea of how these age beliefs that we take in, from our culture can impact different types of health outcomes, including walking speed. And in the different, different studies, we've actually looked at it in different ways. So in some studies, we've compared different cultures that hold different types of age beliefs, cultures that hold more positive age beliefs, and compared them to cultures that hold more negative age beliefs, and then examined different types of health outcomes. Outcomes. We've also conducted longitudinal studies, which involves looking at people over time. So we can look at whether the age beliefs that people have at a younger age, how that predicts different trajectories or patterns of health going forward. And then the third method that we have found is a good way to examine this, the impact of these age beliefs is experimentally. And we've looked at uh, different types of interventions where we can randomly assign people to either a positive age condition or a negative age belief condition. And we've been able to look at different types of health measures before and after people are randomly exposed to these different age belief interventions. And then we uh, then we can see whether different um, outcomes change. And, and some of the outcomes that you measure that you mentioned are some of the, of the outcomes that we've been able to look at. So we have found that 
when we expose older people to positive age beliefs that we tend to see an improvement in memory performance. We tend to see an improvement in walking speed and balance. Uh, so phys physical measures, we've also found that we can see a change in cardiovascular response to stress. So we have found when we expose um, older people to positive age beliefs or we strengthen positive age beliefs that we find a reduction in how stressed people get when they encounter sort of challenging events. And so depending on the study, we've looked at different types of, of, of health outcomes, but we have found evidence for a number of different health outcomes being um, impacted by this age belief intervention. And it, it's also been found in many other studies, um, many other teams in different parts of the country and in different countries. So it seems to be quite a robust pattern. And Dr. Levy, you've mentioned that super centenarians are treated like rock stars in countries like Japan, not so much here. And when we lived in San Francisco and visited San Francisco later, we would often see people in certain parks doing Tai Chi. And what was so interesting is these were often Asian Americans. They were often older. I mean, really older. Gray hair. <laughs> you know, maybe in their 80s and 90s. And there were also younger people with them doing Tai Chi. The, the older folks seemed to be doing it better, slower, and more more beautifully than the younger folks, but that watching these folks do Tai Chi, and it was often really early in the morning. I'm talking six o'clock, just as the sun would come up. And it was such an interesting experience. You know, why is it that in America, we have such sort of negative stereotypes, whereas in other countries, it's quite different? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think there are a lot of things that go into the meaning that a culture tends to give to aging and it changes over time. So we actually, I conducted a, a study with, um, with my, one of my graduate students on age beliefs in the United States, um, Ruben Nick, and he, he, we conducted this computational linguistic study and found that over 200 years that the age beliefs in the United States have changed quite dramatically from being much more positive to unfortunately more negative. So I, I think there are a number of factors that, um, that go into the increase in negativity, but because we see changes over time and changes uh, across cultures, we know that it's not aging itself that is leading to the messages that, that surround aging. I, it's something that's much more malleable. But I think some of the factors that might go into it are um, like, for, we know that there's been a growth in the anti-aging industry um, in this country. There's been a, a big, a huge growth in negative advertising. So advertisers that actually stand to gain profit by promoting negative age beliefs. There's been an increased medicalization and that goes into what you were talking about earlier with the advertisements that you've noticed that are promoting different kind, kinds of medications that, that are quite prevalent. Um, so I, I think there's a number of factors that, and also as we talked about too, there's been an increase in segregation, age segregation. And so we know that as age segregation increases and there's less contact between the generations, that that can foster an increase of, of negative age beliefs as well. So there's not an opportunity to see the many examples of people that defy the stereotypes and, you know, and, and promote intergenerational positive contact. So I, yeah, unfortunately there are these factors that have been increasing, but each of them can be addressed and can be switched so that we can change from more negative messaging to more positive messaging about aging. Well, I would hope that some of your colleagues at Yale, especially in the medical school, would take this message very seriously because when you look at the pay scale in medicine, you know, the, the neurosurgeons, the cardiothoracic surgeons, I mean, they're at the top of the pyramid. Uh, the dermatologists do very well. And then eventually you get down to the internists and the family practice docs and the pediatricians, pediatricians. and the geriatricians. Well, the geriatric physicians, that is to say, the physicians who specialize in geriatrics are at the bottom of the totem pole. That is to say, they're the bottom of the pyramid. They 
they're not making nearly as much and there aren't enough of them and they don't get rewarded for specializing in geriatrics medicine. Maybe that's why there aren't as many of them. That could be. But I guess what I worry about are the negative attitudes that are fostered in medical schools. For example, uh, medical students may hear in their in their rotations about gomers. Get out of my emergency room. And this idea that, well, why would I want to go into geriatrics medicine when I could be a cardiothoracic surgeon and make three times as much? So how do we begin to change the way doctors relate to older people? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. And we know that there is a lot of ageism in healthcare. And I think what you're talking about is exactly right, that that the amount of compensation that we give different types of professionals is definitely a signal of how much value um, society or the medical profession is giving to different professions. And so I think they should probably be paid you know, the most because they're doing this incredibly important work, but um, but they often are, are, are not. Uh, and also it's the reimbursement levels are for geriatric work in different professions t- is much lower than, than what, what should be in, in perhaps working with other, other groups. So that's something that we could definitely change. I think trying to make equity across different types of professions that deal with different types of, of groups, I think would be a, a, you know, a great message and a great way to reward people who are doing really important work. And actually, uh, just a, one thing to point out about that is I came across a study recently that showed that geriatricians are actually tend to describe enjoying their work more than other types of professions. So they actually do get a reward from getting to know these, you know, wonderful older patients often. Um, so, so I think there is some, you know, reward and that is why many people still go go into to geriatrics, you know, in part. But yeah, I do think that the medical profession and medical education would be a great place to promote positive messaging, positive views of aging, try to actually teach some of the um, make sure that people know about this, the strengths that go with aging and not just define aging as a time of decline, but to actually teach uh, about some of the ways that older people can actually um, improve different aspects of their lives as they get older. You know, so I think there are some misconceptions that I have seen in different types of surveys that um, physicians tend to think that depression is a, is a, can be a normal part of aging. And we know it's not. We know that there it's not a normal part of aging. Most older people are not depressed and there are many ways to treat depression in later life. So there's just some, some um, important messages and lessons that it would be great to make part of, of all healthcare education. You are listening to Dr. Becca Levy, Professor of Epidemiology in the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department of the Yale School of Public Health. She's also a professor of psychology at Yale University. Her book, Breaking the Age Code, How Your Age Beliefs Determine How Long and Well You Live, has just been released. After the break, find out what lizard brains and corporate greed have to do with ageism. How much should we worry about our senior moments? Keep listening. Dr. Levy's got a cool story about a man who set out to challenge his memory and succeeded. Ageism is insidious. How can we free our minds? How can we begin to change attitudes in medical schools and healthcare systems? That would be a great place to start. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Gaia Herbs. For more than 30 years, Gaia Herbs has nurtured the connection between people and plants to deliver nature's vitality. Their full-spectrum formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial to get in the way. Learn more at GaiaHerbs.com. That's G-A-I-A Herbs. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. 
The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, the maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs. Their formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial. More information at Gaia, G-A-I-A, herbs.com. When you think of an older relative, who comes to mind? And how are they doing? We are talking about healthy aging today with Dr. Becca Levy, professor of public health and psychology at Yale University. She's author of Breaking the Age Code, How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live. Dr. Levy, you suggest that the causes of ageism can be boiled down to lizard brains and corporate greed. Now, I wonder if you would just expound a bit on how lizard brains and corporate greed are contributing to the problems you're looking at. So part of it is, I think, well, so the corporate greed, you know, we can start with that. So we know that there are a number of industries that make these stunning profits from promoting negative age beliefs, including advertising and the anti-aging industry. And also there's something that Carol Estes, a sociologist, describes as the medical disability complex. And so she writes about how there are a lot of industries and companies that make a lot of money of promoting older people as declining and showing, you know, increased difficulty navigating the world. And by promoting these negative images, um, and particularly with, you know, with advertising, it can lead to people feeling nervous about some changes that happen with aging and can uh, encourage people to go out and buy different products. So, um, so, so I think that is one of the sources of this increased ageism. Um, and then we also know that there are these natural processes. Um, so people naturally do form beliefs and expectations about a number of aspects of their environment just to navigate it. But when the messages that we take in are negative messages about aging, and we know that this can happen as young as age three. So uh, children as young as age three have often taken in the age messages of their culture. And if they're positive, that can be you know, a good thing. But if they're living in a culture that has more negative messaging about aging, unfortunately, it's been shown that children um, in preschool already start to have some of those negative age beliefs. And because th- those beliefs are not yet relevant to their self-identity, often there's no questioning of, of these messages about negative messages about aging. Um, and then also because the process can happen unconsciously or implicitly without our awareness, there is the risk that we take in the negative messages about aging that can exist in a culture and if we don't notice that it's happening, we don't, we're not aware of the process happening, the risk is that if that, those structural ageism messages lead to health challenges, there's a tendency to blame the older person themselves or blame aging itself rather than looking at these structural factors that may also contribute. Dr. Levy, I think one of the areas that concerns older people the most, and maybe even middle-aged people, and that is what we often refer to as senior moments, you know, a memory lapse. Oh, I can't remember a name. I can't remember a date. And I, I'd like to get your feedback on this idea of, of senior moments and also you write about alzheimer free cultures existing where people for example in northern india don't seem to suffer from senility so i i, I wonder if you can give us a sense of you know how we end up sort of not just kind of dealing with this notion of senior moments but how more positive age belief cultures like in India, may have different outcomes? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked about senior moments, because I think that is a very common term (laughs) in our culture. And as you said, it can be used to describe forgetfulness, moments of forgetfulness. 
Um, but the problem with the term is that it equates forgetfulness with aging as if they're one and the same. And we know from the science that there are many examples of, there are many different types of memory. We know that there are some that are very stable over time. So for example, procedural memory or the ability to remember how to ride a bike is, it would be something in, in that category. There's also types of cognition that seem to uh, improve in later life, such as uh, metacognition or the ability to, to think about thinking, the ability to solve conflicts seems to. Um, often there's some studies that show that that can also improve in later life. So this idea of equating uh, this negative stereotype of equating, you know, all cognitive loss um, with aging just doesn't follow follow the science. And also in our in our research, we have found that some of the types of memory and cognition that have been assumed to go down in later life, we have found if we can strengthen positive age beliefs that we can show improvements in those types of uh, memory performance. So yeah, so there's a lot of, of science to show that there's um, that the idea of, of equating cognitive loss as intrinsic to aging, you know, it, it just doesn't follow from the science. But also, as you mentioned, there's interesting cross-cultural findings that also point out to differences in um, how these age beliefs can t uh, match on to memory performance or cognition. And so um, in the book, I I explored different cultures that um, that there have been reports of and that we have found in our research that have um, more positive age beliefs, integrate older people more into society and seem to show some cognitive advantages. I wonder if you would tell us about John Basinger, who set out to challenge his memory. Yes, I'm glad you brought him up. So he's a, a lovely man that I had the opportunity to get to know in writing the book. And he is somebody who took on this wonderful challenge of trying to memorize a 60,000 word poem. And so he was, he's an 84 year old actor and he thought that this would be a fun challenge and he wanted to perform it for his community. Uh, he lives a few towns over from, from where I live in Connecticut and uh, and so he took on this memory task and slowly learned this very long poem and he successfully learned it. And one of the things that I was really struck by in talking to him is that he thought the reason that he was able to take on this task and be successful in th this memory challenge was he had his own positive age belief that he thought of. So, so not only did he portray, you know, a, he was a wonderful example of, of, an, of an older person who, who is, um, was successfully aging, but his own image of aging that he thought about when he took on this memory task was a cellist. So Pablo Casals, he thought of, who was somebody who performed these beautiful cello sonatas in his 70s and 80s and to his early 90s. And so he had this image of this wonderful older performer, and that inspired him and motivated him in his own memory successes. Now, you made it sound like, oh, it's a long poem. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of our <laughs> listeners are thinking, oh, maybe a page or two. But we're talking about a really long poem, John Milton's Paradise Lost. It's, as you describe in your book, about the length of a full novel, such as Lord of the Flies. How in the world did he manage to memorize what must have been hours and hours of of poem that he would recite uh, to family or friends or or colleagues? I, I can't even comprehend how he did it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it is quite remarkable. So and, you know, something that's interesting about him is that he has claimed that he doesn't have a particularly remarkable memory. He, he claims that he's as forgetful as anybody else. He often leaves the house and forgets his planner or, or, you know, or, or something that he needs for the day. So he, he doesn't feel like he's got this extraordinary memory, but he feels like he works really hard on certain types of memory challenges, such as, as memory memorizing this poem. So actually, one of the things that's interesting about him is he has a background in the deaf culture. And he 
found that some of uh, he actually has a way of memorizing that also involves drawing on uh, moving his fingers and trying to kind of physically experience some of the things that he's trying to memorize at the same time. So that was something that he thought was helpful was coming up with uh, sort of a physical language to support the cognitive task that he was taking on. So I think, um, so he, as I mentioned, he was, he did feel like this image of aging that he had of, of this cello player was something that really motivated and inspired him. And some of the methods that he thought was, was really helpful were uh, bringing in a physical element to, to the me- memorization process. Dr. Levy, I'd love to talk about how we can change the situation of ageism. In your book, Breaking the Age Code, you have a chapter on individual age liberation, how to free your mind, and you offer us ABCs. Would you walk us through that, please? Sure. So uh, I developed this method based on a lot of different evidence for the book that I call the ABC method. And the A stands for increasing awareness of ageism. So we talked about earlier how ageism can operate unconsciously or implicitly. And so the first part of this is to increase our awareness of this negative messaging that, um, or the messaging that we encounter in everyday life. And if it's also increases our awareness of some of the positive messaging that we don't always see some of the positive role models of aging that are out there as well. So the first process is um, our exercises around increasing our awareness. The second, the B is for switching blame. So uh, we talked about senior moment for for example. So there's a tendency to blame uh, any kind of health challenge or memory challenge immediately on aging. And I think uh, the B is to think about blame. So is it possible that there are different factors that are contributing to a health challenge that we can actually address? And one of them, uh, I believe, is, is ageism that we can encounter in many aspects of our society. And the C stands for challenge. So uh, I think it's really important to think about when we encounter and become aware of these the negative messages to challenge them. And both that can both happen on an individual level and also ideally would also be happening on a structural level. Um, so thinking about the different ways that those negative messages are getting out there in advertising and uh, in different media and actually find a way to let the advertisers know, let the people who are putting together the, um, these ages shows know that it's just not acceptable to denigrate older people. I think that there is the beginning of awareness, especially when it comes to things like racism and sexism. I mean, people just aren't putting up with it the way they used to maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. But I think a lot of older people are not willing to stand up for themselves when they run into a situation where the doctor starts speaking a lot louder. Why can't you hear me? It's like, okay, um, how do we begin to change attitudes in medical schools and in healthcare systems? Right. Yeah. So I think that's a great question. And I think, I think we can find ways to challenge, you know, ages remarks and ages actions that, that we encounter in different places in the workplace and the healthcare settings. And I, I, something I, I would like to point out about that is that it doesn't have to be right away. So I found in my own, in my own encountering of, of ages messaging that I don't always immediately have a good comeback or a good way to address it, but I think it's fine to come back to a situation a little bit later and, and tell somebody, Hey, you know, what you just said at that meeting was felt like you were dismissing older people. And, and it was maybe said in a way that is, uh, is just, doesn't doesn't match the science and also you know made made people made me feel bad made other people might feel bad in, in the room so i think i think actively challenging but going back to sort of the the challenging um situations is really important and also i think in the book i present 14 myths about aging and the science that shows some of the strengths um, that are associated with different aspects of aging. So I think knowing that science and bringing that to different situations uh, can be really important. But also, as you said, 
going to the source. So going to the source of structural ageism, I think is the key. And so if we can find ways to create a more age just society in which this negative messaging is not prevalent, then we wouldn't need to go back to these different work settings and healthcare settings and, you know, and point out the ageism. Hopefully people in those power roles would be trained to be more inclusive of all different ages and think about aging in a in a in, in the many ways that promote different people of different ages and is you know a much more age just society are there signs that give you hope for the future yes i think there are a number of signs that we are getting close to a tipping point in which an age liberation movement would gain traction uh, and so we know that for example the world health organization recently launched a campaign to combat ageism. And there's something like 146 countries that have advocated for, for this campaign and have, have um, signed on the, the deadline and say that they really feel like it's important that there be a reduction of ageism in their countries. So um, so I think that is, is one example. Uh, I think there's a number of professional organizations that have realized the importance of promoting age, aging and uh, reduce ageism. So exam- for example, there's something called the Gerontological Society of America that's been very active in trying to figure out ways to reduce ageism. Uh, and um, also a number of professional organizations like the American Medical Association has tried to come up with language suggestions so that the different journals and scientific writing describe aging in, in a uh, more inclusive and, and equitable way. They're promoting aging and, um, and, and not implicitly promoting ageism. So I think there's a lot of um, organizations and people that are really becoming aware of the need to reduce ageism and, and promote a more age-just society. Dr. Becca Levy, thank you very much for talking with us on the People's Pharmacy today. My pleasure. Great to talk with you. You've been listening to Dr. Becca Levy, Professor of Epidemiology in the Yale School of Public Health. She's also Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychology at Yale University. Dr. Levy studies psychosocial factors that influence older individuals' cognitive and physical functioning, as well as their longevity. You can read about her research in her book, Breaking the Age Code, How Your Age Beliefs Determine How Long and Well You Live. Lynn Siegel produced today's show, Al Wadarski engineered, Dave Graydon edits our interviews, B.J. Lederman composed our theme music. This show is a co-production of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC, with The People's Pharmacy. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Coco Via, maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs. Their formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial. More information at GaiaHerbs.com. Today's show is number 1,311. You can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com. That's where you can post your comments to let us know what you think about today's interview. Have you ever felt that age was a factor in the way healthcare professionals treat you? Share your story via email at radio at peoplespharmacy.com. Our interviews are available through your favorite podcast provider. We post the show on our website on Monday morning. At peoplespharmacy.com, you can sign up for our free online newsletter to get the latest news about important health stories. By subscribing to our newsletter, you will also have regular access to our weekly podcast and find out ahead of time which topics we'll be covering. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thank you so much for listening today. Please do join us again next week. Thank you for listening to the People's Pharmacy Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure to bring you our award-winning program week in and week out. 
but producing and distributing this show as a free podcast takes time and costs money. If you like what we do and you'd like to help us continue to produce high-quality, independent healthcare journalism, please consider chipping in. All you have to do is go to peoplespharmacy.com slash donate. Whether it's just one time or a monthly donation, you can be part of the team that makes this show possible. Thank you for your continued loyalty and support. We couldn't make our show without you.